Have you ever noticed that some people really have a knack for, for bringing things to life or helping things to thrive, maybe in a specific area. I think of my grandpa, Grandpa Laferney, had such a green thumb. And I, I tell you, he could just take a, a worthless piece of ground and make it into a beautiful garden. And I, I, I think that that's where I got my love for gardening and for being out in the dirt, working out in the yard uh, from him. And it's one of the reasons, uh, frankly, why I love this location where our church gathers on Sundays. We have the most beautiful piece of property. And I feel like that was just a special gift to me and to us from the Lord. I, I love it, uh, especially in the summer and spring when it's all green. And, and it's just, it's a great place to be. And I, I as a kid... Because I got this love of gardening from my grandpa, I actually got to put in a garden. He, he, he brought his rototiller over and tilled up a place in our backyard, and then I planted those seeds and took care of that garden. In fact, I've got a photo to show you of my 12-year-old self. That's me. That's right. This is my favorite photo of myself, and for a couple of reasons. One, I'm super stoked about that head of lettuce. It's my first head of lettuce I grew. Notice that it is whiter than my body. I think that's, that's a lettuce to be proud of, right, right there. Uh, and you can see the garden behind me there, all the nice little rows and everything. But another reason I love this photo, I was having a fantastic hair day. Like, I think Justin Bieber might have got a, a hold of that photo and said, I want to do that with my hair. Absolutely. I, I love it. But I, there's just something about a nice, lush garden. And we're going to look at a, a story that happened in the life of Jesus in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 5. So if you've got a Bible or if you have a Bible app, look up Luke. And chapter 19 is where we're going to be going today. We, we'll put the words up on the screen. Uh, but it's nice just to have the Word of God in your hand so that you can look around it, look at the context, it, reread it, etc. All right, Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 5. Jesus entered Jericho. Okay, this is the name of a city in Israel. All right, and this city was a lush, green, it's an ancient city. Some say it could be the oldest city in the world. I don't know. It's, it's in the area of the Middle East called the Fertile Crescent. It is just a particularly um, a fertile, growing, growing place. And its nickname for the city of Jericho was the City of Palms. City of Palms. And I think that we first hear it called that in the Bible by Moses. So a long time before Jesus. So Jesus entered Jericho and he made his way through the town. And as I was, as I was studying this this week and just looking over this, these, uh, a couple words from this first sentence just really caught my attention. One, he entered the city. Jesus entered the city. And it's just something about that. He enters a lot of cities, but they don't always say it. But the writer says he entered the city and he made his way through the town. Okay, Jesus is on a mission here. He is doing something important. And in fact, it, it appears from, from uh, the, Luke's biography of Jesus that we're reading right now that this might have been right before Palm Sunday. Right, like it could be the day before kind of thing, or, it, or maybe two days before. Uh, so Jesus is heading to Jerusalem, but he enters Jericho, and he makes his way through the town. Well, there was a man there. Someone say, a man. Amen. So he's there, he's entered the city, he's making his way through, and there was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region. If this was a melodrama, we'd all go, boo, boo. <laughs> chief tax collector in the region. And he had become very rich. Boo, boo. Because <laughs> guess how he became rich? Off the people's money. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. And really, wherever Jesus went, there's a crowd of people around him. He was magnetic. He, was a, he had an attractive personality. The Old Testament says he was not necessarily attractive physically, but he attracted the crowds. There was something in his spirit and who he was. So there's a crowd around him. 
Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, is too short to see over the crowd, and so he just wants to get a look at Jesus. So verse 4, so he ran ahead, and we know that it's sort of a rare thing in that day for dignified people to run, especially a dignified man, because he's like got to lift up his skirts and, you know, show his knobby knees and run ahead. So it's like quite a, quite a thing. Like he, he really wanted to see Jesus really badly. So he ran ahead. He climbed up a sycamore fig tree. That's where fig newtons come from. He climbed up a sycamore fig tree beside the road for Jesus was going to pass that way probably like one main road or something, or you could tell by, uh, he just like ran a block or two ahead or whatever. He could tell Jesus come this way, finds this tree beside the road and climbs up it. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he called him by name. Zacchaeus, what's the big deal about that? They'd never met. How would he even know his name? Because he's Jesus, that's how. Jesus said, Zacchaeus, quick, Come down. I must be a guest. And that word guest, it's more than just like stop by for a sec. He was probably saying, I'm going to come spend the night there. That is what most likely. And BT dubs, I got 20 of my friends with me. (laughs) So this is a big deal. Jesus sees Zacchaeus out of the blue up in a tree. He says, Zacchaeus, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. I'm going to come in and stay a while. Now, today and in our country, we might look at that as rude. But let's think about the context. When a royal person invites himself to his subject's house, this is one of the greatest honors that a royal can give. They do it knowing this is an honor. Uh, we know that Queen Elizabeth when she wanted to do something uh, special for Winston Churchill when he was retiring, her, the queen's mother suggested, why don't you go to his house for dinner? It's a great honor. So the queen said, that's a, that's a great idea. She comes in her beautiful gown and she goes into his home. She is gracing his home with her presence. And that was one of the greatest things that Queen Elizabeth could do. She didn't buy him an expensive gift. She came into his home. And that's the sense I get here. Jesus invites himself to Zacchaeus' home knowing that the privilege would be received as an honor. It would be appreciated by him. There is a very special verse that we quote a lot of times. It's not in this chapter, but in the last book of the Bible, in Revelation 3.20, we know that Jesus continues today to show up and knock on the door of your home. He said, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. This is Jesus' words. And this is one of my favorite things about Jesus. He loves to eat with friends. <laughs> you, if you've been in our church for a while, you know, you've heard me say this. I just keep finding more spots where Jesus is like, you got any fish? (laughs) Like he just wants to come because there's something about eating together that is, it signifies family and friendship. It's fellowship. And Jesus loves that. Okay, back to our our chapter in Luke. Luke 19, verse six. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down from that tree and he took Jesus to his house like really mad no, in great excitement and joy. Now, if, if, if someone a royal came to our house, like we, we'd be going, I think we're ready. <laughs> I, think it, I think it's pretty clean. He just said, wow, this is the best thing ever. So with great excitement and joy, he took Jesus to his house. But, somebody say but. But the people were displeased. The crowd, not happy. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Remember, this is the head tax collector who's gotten rich by taking too much out of your pocket. The crowd is ticked. They are peeved. Why? Why? Because, you know, they're not mad at Zacchaeus. Who's the crowd displeased with? Jesus. 
Why are they so displeased about Jesus? I started thinking about this. Why? I don't know. Maybe they were jealous. Maybe they were like, I don't want him to go to that house. I want him to come to my house. Or maybe they wanted, you know, to feel like called out, selected, chosen, special. Maybe they, maybe they thought, you know what? I've been living right. If anyone deserves to have Jesus come to their house, it's me. It's not Zacchaeus. This, it's a, he had a Jewish name, so we assume that he is a, a Jewish person. But he was considered kind of a traitor because he's working for the Roman government collecting taxes. So I'm sure there were people in the crowd that were like, no, I deserve it. He does not deserve it. Or maybe they thought, it's not worth it for Jesus to go to his house. He will never change. Zacchaeus, he will never become a follower of Jesus, an apprentice of Jesus. After all, why would he? Zacchaeus was rich. He had status. He's good. He was probably a very self-confident person, at least on the outside. He would have appeared that way. He was streetwise. He was in tight with the Roman government, so he had, in a sense, an umbrella of protection over him that no one else even had. Why would he ever change, or why would he ever follow Jesus? And so many times, we feel discouraged because it seems like there's no use even trying to share Jesus with most of the non-Christian people that are around us. We're caught in this tension between believing it would be good if every person put their faith in Jesus, but also feeling guilty because uh, Jesus said, go and make disciples, but I haven't really been doing that very much lately. And the tension between thinking that most people don't even want to hear the good news about Jesus. Have you ever thought to yourself, oh, there's this person in my life, uh, it's no use. Why even bring Jesus up? They, they'll probably just laugh at me or she'll probably get mad and just reject me as a friend or, oh no, no, he... He already sees himself as a good person. He, he, he probably doesn't want to hear. Or she would never believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Or, oh no, no, he, no. He, he won't think Jesus is relevant to his life. That's exactly how Zacchaeus seemed to the crowd. That's exa- all those things, that's exactly what the crowd was saying about Zacchaeus. He will never follow Jesus. He would not be interested. He has got his own thing going on. That's exactly how they viewed Zacchaeus. In verse 8, same chapter. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. There is a sudden change in Zacchaeus' heart. It was internal, so the crowd couldn't see it. Jesus, or Zacchaeus, rather, had been the chosen. He had been chosen by Jesus. And his heart responded, yes, Lord, yes. He immediately obeyed when Jesus said, I need to go and be a guest in your house. He came down, took Jesus to his home in joy and excitement. There was a change. But once Jesus was there, he suddenly felt aware and guilty about two sins in his life. Jesus didn't nail him on this. Jesus just said, I want to be your guest. I just want to be with you. And in the very presence of Jesus, all of a sudden Zacchaeus is aware of what's been going on in his life. And aware of two specific areas where he, uh, th- he knew they were close to God's heart, but he had been missing the mark. Two areas that we know from the whole Bible. God, two of the areas God cares about. Caring for the poor and integrity in business. There are whole chapters of the Bible written about that. Whole sections, at least, of, of, of the Bible written about those two things. That matters a lot to God. And suddenly, Zacchaeus realized, 
I've not been doing these things that matter to God. And so he, what does he do? He did something specific about it. He didn't, just, he didn't just go, oh, I'm sorry, I'm feeling kind of bad, feeling kind of guilty. He said, I am making a vow to make amends. So, so he says, he just comes up with all of his own, I'm going to give away half of my wealth. Now, when he said this, he's talking just even about his, his salary, his savings. Not even talking about the cheating part, the stealing part. The, the, he's just said, I'm going to give half of my wealth, half of my estate. He would have had to sell some things in order to give that away as cash. And then he said, on that area where I have actually taken extra and padded my wallet with it, I'm going to pay back four times. So he's not only giving away half his wealth, but he's taken another big chunk on top of that to pay back four times what he stole from people. And all of this proved to Jesus and to anyone else who was paying attention that Zacchaeus was experiencing transformation on the inside. Last Sunday, we read what Paul wrote in his letter to the church in the city of Corinth. In, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Someone say a new person. Yeah. Yep. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Praise the Lord. Even with all his wealth, there was no way Zacchaeus could have paid enough to God to remove his sin. He couldn't use money to do that. You can't bribe God. That's not how it works. But because there was an internal change of his heart in the presence of Jesus, it produced an outward change in behavior something that could be seen on the outside. He had suddenly experienced the generosity of Jesus, that he would come into his house, the least under, I mean, the most undeserving guy around. Jesus honored him by coming into his house. That's very generous. And suddenly, Zacchaeus says, I gotta be generous. No one commanded him to. It was the response in his heart because of what had happened in his heart. He had experienced the Lord's generosity and acceptance. And so he responded with a newfound generosity of his own. So look at the change that's happened in Zacchaeus' life very quickly. He's changed from being a consumer to being a contributor. He's changed from being selfish to selfless. He's changed from being the object of scorn of the people to becoming a role model of repentance. He was changed from condemned to commended by God. He was changed from lost to found. And I see some very, very good news here today. And this is what I wanted to focus on today. Jesus renews the life of every person who opens up to him. Jesus renews the life of every person who opens up to him. Wow. That is awesome. And we're going to read just that last little bit of Zacchaeus' story, verse 9 and 10. Jesus responded. So Zacchaeus makes this vow. I'm going to give away my wealth to help the poor and to repay, make amends for my, my, my theft. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. Because he was an Israelite, he was by birth, a son of Abraham, but Jesus said there's a lot of Israelites who are not true sons of the faith of Abraham. But Jesus said this man has shown himself he is a true son of Abraham, a son of the faith. For the son of man, that's Jesus, came to seek, and that word means to try to get to something that you desire, try to reach something you desire. Jesus desired Zacchaeus and he desires every one of us to be in his family. For the, he said, for the Son of Man, that's me, I came to seek 
and to save those who are lost. And that word save is a word, the root word is a, a word that means saved, healed, and delivered. Jesus said, I came, like the whole point of me coming was to seek out relationship with you, with the people that I desire and love. And to not only just be, to seek you, but to save you, to heal you spiritually, physically, to, to save you from judgment, to deliver you from torment. That's why Jesus came, to seek and save the lost. Definition of a lost person, anyone who's lost from God's presence, lost from his family, we all start out lost. But some of us come to Jesus and we open up to him and he transforms us. Can you imagine what would have happened if Jesus had felt too discouraged about people's lack of faith? And if he had been so discouraged that he wouldn't have reached out to Zacchaeus that day? Can you imagine? Or Jesus might have thought, oh, he's rich and successful. He doesn't need me. He's got everything that he's going to be interested in. Or what if Jesus had thought to himself, oh, man, he's such a fully committed criminal. He'd never be interested in turning from that life to God. What, what if Jesus had said that? But he didn't say that. What if the good news that Jesus renews the life of every person who opens up to him. What if the good news could, be overcome, could overwhelm the discouragement? What if the good news could overwhelm, overshadow, overtake the discouragement? What if that good news that Jesus renews the life of every person who opens up to him could overwhelm the discouragement that we feel when we think about the people we interact with in our lives, our coworkers, our classmates, our neighbors, our family members that are lost, that are outside of God's family. Zacchaeus had a change of heart. What if the people in the crowd had had a change of heart? Maybe the crowd would have gathered around Zacchaeus, slapped him on the back, high-fived him and said, man, you are going to be so blessed today. I know when Jesus comes into your house, good things are going to happen to you. What if they had said that instead? Or maybe the crowd uh, could, have, could have reacted to Jesus by saying to each other, man, this is going to be a good day. Because when Jesus comes in, he renews lives. He changes lives. I bet Zacchaeus is not going to be stealing from us anymore. This is going to be awesome. I love it. So happy that Jesus is coming in. Maybe the people in the crowd could have thought to themselves, wow, Jesus loves everybody. Jesus wants to be with everybody. Man, you know, I know somebody. I wonder about if Jesus would want to be with that friend, with that family member, with that coworker. Can you imagine if the crowd had begun to think like that? What if you could let the good news that Jesus renews the life of every person who opens up to him, what if you let that good news overwhelm the discouragement you sometimes feel as a believer in Jesus Christ. Discouragement thinking, oh, there's people in my life that I know need Jesus, but oh, I probably couldn't do it. They probably wouldn't really want him. What if that good news could take over for your discouragement? Wow, what would change in your life? What would change in my life? What would change in the people's lives in your circle of friends and circle of family? Well, what, what if? I began to think about that. What if that did happen? Maybe you would think, huh, I wonder if they would want to hear about Jesus. Maybe they are open to spiritual solutions and for, for life's problems. Maybe if you could let the good news overcome your discouragement, you would intentionally grow your friendship and your love for a non-Christian in your circle. 
maybe if that good news could overwhelm the discouragement in you, maybe you would start including the parts of your story, your life story, that give Jesus honor when you tell others about your life. Instead of like leaving that aside, instead of saying, I used to, have, I used to really struggle, but I worked really hard and now I'm doing great. What if instead you said, I was really struggling, then someone introduced me to Jesus and he began to change my life. He didn't change everything immediately, but he began a process of transformation. And, and now I'm, I'm, so, I'm worlds ahead of where I was then. What if the good news could overwhelm the discouragement in you, the discouragement about thinking, oh, it probably wouldn't work to share Jesus with, someone, with that person I know or that person I know. Maybe you would talk about Jesus to that person who says he highly values tolerance. Maybe you'd finally have a conversation with that person. Maybe you would invite a non-churchgoer to come to one of the Easter services or just to come to any service on a Sunday to honestly assess who Jesus is and who his followers are. It's easy to stand outside these walls and say, oh yeah, Jesus is dumb, his people are dumb. It's another thing to come and just find out for yourself, is he? Maybe, maybe they will discover that Jesus is actually pretty awesome and he transforms lives. He renews life when you open up to him. Would you stand to your feet? I'd like to just conclude this message with prayer. Would you bow your heads for a moment with me? And let, let's pray. Prayer is talking to Jesus and listening to Jesus. That's prayer. Let's do that now. Jesus, we believe that it's very good news that you renew the life of every person that opens up to you. And Jesus, I believe that because of all the stories in the Bible, but I also believe it because that's what you've done for me, Jesus. I have opened up my life to you, and you have renewed my life, and you are renewing my life. You even showed me a couple things this week that we're going to be working on in my life. Thank you, Jesus. And I open up my heart to you to do that work. And I commit to doing my part, to doing that work and cooperating with you. Thank you, Jesus, that as we open ourselves up to you, you renew our lives. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see the people in our lives. Would you just, if you're in this room or if you're watching this service online, would you just begin to think of the people in your life? Neighbors, friends, co-workers, family members. Lord Jesus, I pray you would help us to see them the way you saw Zacchaeus, not the way the crowd saw Zacchaeus. Help us to see them with hope and help us to see them uh, realizing that you want to just renew their life. Spiritually speaking, and a lot of times that overflows into other areas as well. Lord, help us to see our friends and family and coworkers, classmates that way. Help us to see them with new eyes starting right now, Jesus. Help us to see them the way you see them, Lord. Help us to believe for new life in them, renewed life. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to help them to open up to you. Because we know if they will just do that, you will renew their life. Lord, I trust you. I trust you, Lord, to do that work. We trust you with the people that we care about. We trust you, Lord. So help us to introduce them to you, Lord. And with your head still bowed, I want to just give you one more invitation to prayer. And I, I don't know if you have opened up your heart to Jesus yet, if you have opened up your life to him. But if you haven't, I want to it, it just encourage you, invite you today to put your faith in Jesus to actually become his apprentice, to invest time with him, be with him, learn from him, work with him, follow him. How do you do that? Turn away from your sin, 
Turn your life over to Jesus and let him lead. That's how it starts right there. And that's, that's what happened with Zacchaeus. He just began to turn his life over to Jesus right then. And all of a sudden, his life took a different path. If today you would like to put your faith in Jesus, with uh, everyone's heads are bowed. We're kind of in this atmosphere of prayer. And uh, Christians are praying for others in the room. And uh, uh, if you today want to give your life to Jesus, put your faith in him, would you just raise your hand? Just shoot, shoot me a hand real quick so I know that I should pray for you specifically. I just, I just know that if you will open up to Jesus, he will renew your life. And that's why I want to give this invitation to you online. I can't see you raise your hand, but God can. I just want to encourage you to do that today. If you're, if you're putting your faith in Jesus today, I'd love to just coach you in a prayer. Would you pray after me in church? We're just going to pray with them and support them and help them out. Would you pray after me? Jesus, Jesus I, invite I invite you into my life. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. So please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and be transformed to be your apprentice starting now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you just pray that prayer, we say welcome to the fellowship of God, the family of God, the kingdom of God. And we've got a special course to just help you get started and, and grow that relationship with Jesus, following Jesus' course. I'll let you tell a little bit more about that. Real change is possible, That's amen. That's right, amen. It happened in Zacchaeus, it can happen in you too. Amen, amen. Well, um, if you did fill out that Connect card, please just on your way out, put it in that little box in the back. If you have not filled out the Connect card, you have 2.5 seconds to do so. Um, also, again, with the following Jesus cor course, please, if, if, if today was your day or if you, if, if you were a newer believer in Jesus, please stop by that little table in the lobby, pick up one of those bags, talk with Larry, and he'll get you set up. We, have, it, we want to equip you. You know, following Jesus is something we do together. And so we want to equip you for that. So we'll, we'll, we'll buy you a book, we'll buy you a course, do all that stuff for you. Amen? Well, you have to take this step and get started. All right. Also, we're having a special event after service today. So we could use maybe five or six guys and gals to help um, set up for that. So if you are able, please stay. Come talk to me after service, and we'll set up tables and things for that too. All right. We love you guys. We will see you next week in person and online. God bless.